And today um, we are going to talk about writing. Uh, we're going to talk about effective writing with a bit of a focus on major and planned gifts, although a lot of this is going to be pretty broadly uh, applicable to a lot of your fundraising. Um, I will say that the uh, the webinars that that I find the most interesting are uh, the ones about different generations and how sort of demographics is shaping. Um, the ones that I that I'm sort of most fascinated to do the research for is the ones we do on AI. I'm really interested in that. Um, but I would I will say I think the writing ones make me the happiest. I think it's just it's such a it's just sort of like a study of of humans and how humans are and how we are and um, love when I get the chance to do some writing myself. And so I'm just really glad to be here and thank you for being here. A um, couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get started. As I mentioned, congratulations Natasia for officially CFRE certified. Um, this is a the certified fundraising executive. So if this is something you care about, great. If not, no problem. Um, this event is approved for 1.0 CFRE. At the end of the session, there is a survey. We will drop a link to the chat link to the survey in the chat. You will fill out the survey, certifies your participation. Please, please do that. Um, uh, there's also a question about whether the recording will be available. Yes, it will. So we will send you the recording and the slides after the fact. Here's the agenda. Uh, mostly a little bit of stuff around what makes great writing and how to do it, right? That's really what we're talking about today. Uh, so excited to be doing this. Quick intros, uh, I met many of you personally. And professionally, uh, my name is Patrick. I am the co-CEO of Free Will alongside Jenny, who is wonderful and pictured here. And we get to work alongside this amazing team, uh, closing in on $8 billion raised for charity, uh, well past 1,200 wonderful nonprofit partners, probably hopefully 1,300 soon, which is very exciting. If this is you, thank you. I'm really excited to do this. Um, maybe one more thing on intros before we uh, wrap up here. Um, I am really excited to be in Utah in a week, uh, and I'm keynoting the AFP Fundraising Day in Utah on June 1st. So if you are in Salt Lake City or you are in uh, somewhere else in Utah and come into that, uh, please come say hi. I would love to meet you. I uh, would love to see you all there. And then just a little more background on me. Uh, years ago, um, I used to run email fundraising for President Obama. And so a lot of the, the best practices in uh, great fundraising writing comes from my time there and a lot of the learnings, as well as obviously a lot of research that we did there. So I uh, don't care about your politics, but what, what you, you can probably agree on is we raised a lot of money online. Um, and one of the nice things about this is there were 10 million people that we could email. And so what that meant is that we were constantly running experiments, right? Most of you don't have 10 million people on your email list, totally fine. But we could run different versions of emails to 100,000 people at a time. We start at 9 a.m. and by noon, we know which is the best version to send to the remaining nine and a half million people. And we learned a ton in part because we were often wrong. We'd often say, I think this is gonna be much better, which you know, if you're working at an organization with 50,000 donors, that's an amazing organization, uh, much harder to run that. So um, got to learn a ton. We would often sort of place uh, not actual money, but bets on what we thought would do better. Most of the smartest people on our team were wrong at least half the time. So a monkey would have would have outperformed it. So we, we got to learn a lot by experimentation, et cetera. Um, uh, Joe makes the point that Patrick is taller than I thought. Obama is 6'2". I am. I'm 6'4". Look at how tall Michelle is. People forget how tall Michelle is. She's I think she's solidly 6'2", 6'3". Uh, she might be in heels here. I'm not sure. Um, but 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 both of them are quite uh, quite vertically gifted there. Um, one last thing before we get started, uh, one of my favorite books ever is this book uh, by William Zinsner called On Writing Well, uh, 30th anniversary <laughs> edition probably came out 15 years ago, so it's old, um, but it's a really good book on, on effective writing, and I would strongly recommend uh, reading it if you haven't, obviously we get no, you know, there's no, there's no commission here, we're just telling you about the books that I love. And we are going to send a copy of this to 20 people as a gift. So the way that works, again, at the end of the session, there will be a link in the chat to a survey. Same thing with the CFRA uh, attendance. So just make a note there, include your address, that way we can send it to you. Um, we really love this book. Uh, it's, a, it's a real, um, it's, it's tech, both technically a gift and it's, it's sort of a gift to the world. It's a great, great book on, on writing that. 
Um, all right, so how's your week going? Couple good things to see here. Look at happiness bouncing way up, um, anxiety down a bunch. Maybe that's, you know, summer really in sight. A Memorial Day in the US is, is not far away. Um, so really nice to see there. A little bit of a dip here in how confident people are about hitting their goals, but still pretty high. So second highest of the year and really second highest since April 26th of last year. So what's happening? Some pretty good economic news. Um, hopefully people are continuing to see strong results. Those of you that have um, sort of June 30th, July 1 fiscal years, hopefully seeing strong results from your class giving days or other things like that. Um, so that's pretty exciting. All right, let's talk about what writing is, why, why writing really matters in 2023. Um, obviously writing's mattered for a long time. A couple things here, online writing is getting incredibly important, right? So 93% of all adults are online. The other 7% are mostly lying, right? 48% of US adults in that early bracket are constantly online. When we talk about people who are constantly online, constantly reading, right? You see that, that you know, how much it is, even among the 50 to 64 bracket, 22% say they're constantly online. This survey is two years old. So what it means is that this trend is continuing and all these numbers are dialed up today. So uh, really important point here. When we look at where people are preferring to give, um, what you see here is that that so the silent generation, folks who are currently, what, 78 and older, are the last group to prefer direct mail to online giving, and it's close, right? It's close among the 78 plus crowd. You look at boomers and then you know, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, huge preference for online giving. So email fundraising in particular, which is what we'll talk about a lot today, is just driving an enormous amount of giving. And you're starting to see that across the board. With this entire shift to people's lives online, there's a lot more what we call pre-shopping and education. And what we mean here is that, that a lot of folks are conducting online research before making a purchase. They want to read before they speak to someone. So this is true for your major giving as well and, this, and, and your plan giving donors. So a lot more people are reading, thinking before the first conversation, which would not have been true call it five, six, 10 years ago. So this is how the world is shifting. Online giving is obviously dialed up a ton. Online giving grew by 23% last year compared to 15% the previous year. 50% of last year's nonprofit websites visits came from mobile and tablet users. So that's another way the world is shifting. Desktop traffic is actually going down, which is not what you might expect. It's going down because more and more people are reading more and more on their phones and on tablets. Since 2016, online has increased by every generation, every year. Millennials saw the biggest jump. Up to 81% of millennials are giving online in 2022. Um, and then you go to the other end, you start looking at plan giving do donors, older donors. And it turns out that email is now driving an enormous percentage of plan gifts, which again was not true five or 10 years ago. In fact, we, what we call standalone emails, which is an email only about plan giving, uh, twice as effective as other routes, and by far the number one driver of planned gifts among partners that we get to work closely with and really see. So this is, this is pretty exciting. What else is happening? Um, because this is all becoming more important, it also means there's more competition. So donors across all generations are more likely to respond to email, but our inboxes are getting a bit more crowded. Right? On average, people receive 121 business emails per day or commercial emails. That's not including the spam that goes right to your spam filter. And fundraising emails are seeing a little bit of a drop from 2021 because there's a lot of noise, right? Not just from other charities, which honestly is not the real challenge. It's the hotels, the restaurants, the cruise ships, right? The travel agents, the gym, the yoga studio, uh, all these things that are saying, oh, great, email fundraising and email marketing really works. I'm going to use it to sell more tacos, to sell more massages, to sell more doctor's visits, right? This is all happening. Um, when we look at how we, people prefer, when we ask donors, number one thing is say, send me emails, right? Uh, other things are great. Uh, number one piece here. On a scale of one to five, we asked you how confident you are in your own writing abilities. And the average is a four. So much higher than a lot of the other sessions we do. Um, over 50% of folks actually rated themselves exactly a four. Uh, we saw almost identical results last year. Right? So that's sort of roughly where people are. If you're a two or a three, no problem. If you're a five, we're still going to hopefully teach you some things today. 
So let's talk about how to be a great writer. And when we talk about how to be a great writer, we don't mean sort of generically a great writer, right? James Joyce is a great writer. James Joyce would be a terrible nonprofit fundraising writer, right? So we're talking specifically about um, what it looks like to be a great writer in your work today at this time, right? So first things first, great writing is simple. What we mean by that is it's easy to understand and it's skimmable. One of the most influential things that I've read about writing is this fact here. Emails written at a third grade level receive 36% more responses than those at a college reading level and 17 more responses than those at a high school reading level. Now, this doesn't mean you don't get to talk about complex topics, but you do so as clearly and simply as possible, right? Many of, many of you have said that you enjoy these webinars and the webinars are heavily influenced by this fact itself. How do we take the really important stuff break it down, make it extremely simple, extremely clear, extremely understandable, and then people remember it a lot more, right? It moves people a lot more. So we're taking out heavy jargon, especially when we're talking about different giving types or plan giving, right? We're not using these words at all. That can feel intimidating and overwhelming. We don't want the reader to get lost in legal or financial details and have it just go right over their head. Um, so clear clarity is, is our number one. If it's not clear, might as well skip it. Second thing, as I mentioned, the world is changing. And so increasingly great writing is concise. 62% of emails are now read on mobile devices. So we're keeping it short. Maybe it's 125 words, maybe it's three paragraphs. It can be longer, but it has to be extremely compelling to get folks to wanna to continue to read, right? So it's, it's no longer okay to be sort of generic and write a five or six or seven paragraph email. The average attention span is just 47 seconds. In general, we're gonna show you in a second how long it, you know, people are reading most emails for. Great writing is specific. So we're telling stories of an individual over an overly broad uh, group. Emails with donor testimonials drive higher bequest rates, for instance, and those without, because we can really imagine ourselves as one person, not a group, right? It's very hard to empathize with a large number of people. And in fact, presenting general statistics alongside an individual story even though it's almost impossible for some of you not to do, it actually decreases giving, right? And so really focus on the specificity is quite helpful. Point four, great writing has emotion. Using a moderate amount of emotion can increase your response rate by 10 to 15%. And that is true in either direction. Positive things like great, wonderful, delight, please, negative, bad, hate, furious, terrible. What it can't be, by the way, is super extreme in one direction or another, that tends to lose you some credibility, right? And so there's some interesting research there. You can click through when we, when we send you the PDF into the study from Boomerang, but really interesting to see neutral stuff, right? If it's really flat, it's not going to get anybody excited and move them to action. Uh, great writing tells a story. So the research shows that storytelling helps us build connection. It helps us raise awareness. It helps show impact. And, and in fact, there's some research that shows that stories are remembered up to 22 times more than facts alone. So if we're really thinking about really getting close to our donors, being memorable to our donors, stories really, really matter. 56% of those who support nonprofits online confirm that compelling storytelling is what actually drives them to action. Now, that's what they say. Um, but actually, the research, when you look at sort of the brain waves, it, it confirms this. So narrative arcs right, inner stories, produce love and stress hormones. These affect the way we feel. This affects how we act. There's an experiment that showed participants who watched an emotional story and produce, uh, produce what we call oxytocin were more willing to donate to charity afterwards, right? And so you get this sort of, uh, you get the feelings because the chemicals in our brain shift when we start to tell stories. So let's talk about writing. You know, th this is sort of general uh, compelling writing. Let's talk about some very specific tips for mass fundraising appeals. And we're gonna construct this point by point by point, right? So what you should have here, and it's, you know, it's probably the 19 minute mark in our webinar, you can go back to this. This should be your recipe when you're cooking up your next, your, your next fundraising email. And if you follow this step-by-step -step process, you should be pretty successful, right? So what's step one? We need to pick a subject line. Um, just, just as a small point here, you are probably not spending enough time thinking about subject lines. So a lot of you will really sort of hustle and work and anguish over the email. And then the end will sort of dash off some subject lines. 
this may be the most important part of the whole email because 64% of people decide to open or delete based on the subject line alone. So if you're not really putting some focus on this, you're sort of wasting all that other effort. Remember again, that the average person receives 120 plus business emails a day. So we need to stand out. And the way we stand out is, and I'll show you this in a second, is what we call the curiosity gap. What is the gap between what I currently know and what I want to know, right? That's the curiosity gap. So a subject line should pique their interest. It's like pausing at a climactic moment in a story. We're not over-promising, right? So we can't say, you know, the, the super secret recipe to making a billion dollars a day. People will click it, but then they'll feel cheated and they will delete it and probably not open the next one. So we're not doing clickbait. We are keeping it short and aiming for six to eight words. So a couple other things, um, get through that. So here's an example of this curiosity gap, right? The gap between what you know and what you want to know. So if we see this, right? If you are in the museum, if you are, um, if you are your alma mater, if you are the church, um, something like a new trend that we are seeing, or a thought of you today, right? You can you know, put yourself in the donor's shoes. Are you opening these or are you not? Um, a big change at the land trust, right? Seems important. Maybe I'll just click through just to figure out what that big change is. Our cutest puppy of the week, you're probably gonna open that one. Um, what this student accomplished, the two most impactful steps, a tool that is getting a lot of use, a better way to help, uh, et cetera, right? So these are all examples of this framework of the curiosity gap. And, and when you take a look at your next email fundraising, your next fundraising email, excuse me, think about how do we actually work this stuff in? I mean, this is really, really important. Uh, tip two, we really want an attention grabbing first line. So the average person is now spending only nine seconds reading an email down from 13 and a half in 2018. That's actually a pretty big shift. And so we have a very small window to capture the attention of donors before they move on. Right? Very small. So after our subject line, this becomes the most important part. The subject line earns us the right to get here. This part earns us the right to tell the rest of the story. We're starting with the most important info to the reader to keep pushing them reading on, updates at the organization, big news about your work, how you are providing value to the reader. Why should I, you know, you need to look at these, these first two sentences and say, why does this compel me to continue to read? Are you making a list for spring cleaning? Here's one thing you actually need to check off. There's a huge change underway at the museum and I thought you might like to know. The class of 2023 is facing three major challenges right now. I wanted to share what person X did this week and I hope it makes you really happy, right? Now, again, in the donor's shoes, you can imagine, oh, I'll, I'll probably keep reading here, right? Th this looks like something that will add value to me to understand and I'm really curious. Then what we do, and then we get to the core of it, is we highlight what we call the impact gap. So not the curiosity gap, the impact gap. The impact gap is three steps to really clarify and move the donor to action. And the big question we're answering is what is newly possible with your help? So three parts again, we're defining the present moment. Uh, in this case, we're gonna use an animal shelter as an example. This month, our animal rescue took in several new litters. What's the problem? but our shelter is facing rising pet food costs and the litters need extensive veterinary care, okay? So we've got situation, we've got a problem, oops, and then we got a solution, but the solution is dependent on the supporter's help. So with your support, we can make sure these kittens get the food and help they need to be adopted and thrive in their forever homes, right? So if you're an animal, animal shelter, just use, you can use this language. If not, you can think about how it applies to you, but you get this sense of, uh, there's a future that I think you, the donor, want, and I'm giving you the path to get us to that future, which is usually through contributing, right? So this is a really exciting avenue. Um, the other thing we're doing here is we're explaining what the gifts will actually do. Don't just say you're going to have a big impact. Say how it will help the mission in general. Tangible impact always, always wins. So an example is one share of stock could provide 80 meals. This scholarship will help one lower income student shift the course of their life. Or even things like a gift from your IRA will help us reach the 90% threshold for the class of 1965, right? So it's very, one gift makes a difference, not sort of general, we're all chipping in. One gift makes a big difference. 
Now we talked about why, you know, how writing is changing in 2023. And this idea of anchor points, right? This tangible impact piece is really, really important during economically uncertain times. Now, it seems like we may actually be in a pretty good economic year, but it's still sort of always better to do this. And when we think about anchor points, what we mean is, what is the point of comparison that I'm comparing this gift to? So there are three potential anchor points, and I, I want to make sure everyone really understands this. And then when they look at their email writing, try to figure out what are we actually anchoring to? So there's one anchor point that is, how much does this cost me, right? If you want to sell me a cookie for 20 bucks, be like, mm, 20 bucks is a lot of money. I think about the other things that I can do with 20 bucks. How much am I saving? So this is particularly true in taxes. Um, the the uh, cookie is $20, but I'm suddenly going to get a $12 rebate. Mm, wow, this rebate feels good, even though I'm getting you know, somehow an $8 cookie. And then what impact am I having? What am I actually getting for the money? And if I think about that, that's going to be quite different. So we really want to help our donors focus on the second and the third, or often both, but not the first. So we'll talk about what that looks like in practice here. So here's an example, right? We're a land trust. You're a land trust. Many of you actually work at a land trust, but some of you don't. But just put yourself in those shoes. And we have a big project. So one thing we can do to our, you know, over email or even in person with our major donors is say, can you give $10,000 to the land trust this year, right? Theoretically, if we're asking for $10,000, it's probably a one-to-one -one message followed up by a, an in-person visit or something. Now, if I'm the donor, what do I think? I think, ooh, $10,000 is a lot of money. That's, you know, um, a lot of car payments. It's, you know, full or half tuition or whatever on private school for the grandkids. It's, you know, it's a full vacation plus, who knows? Another way to think about this is, did you know that by giving a gift of $10,000 in appreciated stock, you might be able to save more than $5,000 in taxes this year? Now we're talking about savings, right? And we'll go into this in a different session, but stacking uh, tax deductions and capital gains avoidance allows things like stock giving to be incredibly beneficial. Now, most people feel like, wow, $10,000 in impact for only $5,000, that feels a lot better. You can already see how that might be a little bit more appealing than that first one. Now, the third one, right, with a gift of $10,000 of appreciated stock, you can help us finally open the path through the preserve. And this will give thousands of families a chance to experience nature in a new way next year. Now we're anchoring impact. I'm like, whoa, $10,000, that's a lot of money. But for $10,000, I can help thousands of families experience nature in a new way. Sign me up, right? And, and you get that sort of different feeling. This is all the same amount of money. But if you're anchoring on that first one, you might be getting a no, whereas you're much more likely to get a yes on that third one or combining two and three, right? So this is really important pieces here. Tip four, um, we're going to keep it conversational. So tone of voice really matters. You want to write like you're speaking to a close friend or a family member. Too often people overly professionalize this. And a, a great, a great uh, tip here is actually just picture the person you're writing. I know some fundraising writers that actually have a photo on their little monitor of the person they're writing to. And writing in a one-to-one -one tone actually makes it much more compelling for the reader. Um, we're using simple human language. We talked about this earlier, especially when we talk about things like plan giving or stock giving, keeping it simple. We're cutting out jargon and big words. And so that's a really important piece here. Uh, tip five, especially when you can either using technology or if you're customizing this for uh, individual donors, we do wanna remember personalization and your supporters are starting to expect this from you. Obviously we're including their first name, great start. We can go a lot further. But where do they live? What's their last gift amount? Um, an example here is your recent gift of X helped us feed a puppy in need. By making a bequest, you'll leave a life-saving legacy. Thanks for the big impact you helped us made in California. Help us continue our work in the future by making a bequest. A couple of examples uh, here that if you can use this in your CRM using conditional content. So if a donor is a, month, is a monthly donor, you might want to use language like, as a monthly donor, you know the importance of ongoing support. And by making a bequest, we'll, making a bequest will sustain our work for decades, right? You start to have this where it feels like I'm really being spoken to as I'm just, instead of being broadcasted to. Um, tip six here, leading with humanity. Um, this is not the humanity of the donor, it's the humanity of you. And so when we're keeping this communication personal and actually making it 
you know, feel much more one-to-one, -one, we want to say I instead of we, unless you're writing from multiple people. And a general tip is don't write from multiple people. That's not a thing that normal people do in their lives. Now, occasionally you can say, you know, from Michael on behalf of the board, right? From Sarah and the whole team here, but really center on that one person, right? And if it's two people, make sure you're clear why you're writing, um, why you're writing two people. But generally we want to have it one person. Um, we also want to be vulnerable and human. So if there are things that, that really matter to you, if there's a personal connection to the cause, make it known. So here's an example if you're a major donor or major gift officer, I'm fostering one of our newest puppies at home. And it's been hard trying to help him adjust to people before he finds his forever home. But I'm writing because X matters more than ever. Um, if you are, for instance, if you have students who are the first generation to uh, go to college at your school and they are writing, that's much more compelling than sort of a generic message from the university, which, which we see a lot of. Um, tip seven, really important. Most people know this, but they still don't use it. So I wanna, I wanna nudge you here to use it, um, including a donor story to let supporters know they're one of many, or even saying many people are doing this, would you like to join them? Um, interest in leaving a bequest increases by 15% when donors believe they're one of many supporters doing the same, right? Uh, sorry, increases to 15%. So it actually triples here. This is great research out of a team actually in the UK. And they looked across thousands and thousands of estate plans. And they had solicitors do one of three things. And they said no solicitors, meaning lawyers uh, in the UK. Uh, no mention of charity, 5% of people included a charitable gift in their will. If you said, would you like to leave any money in charity in your will? Already doubled, right? So asking is really, really, really important. But it tripled when it said many of our customers leave to money and charity in their will. Are there any causes that you're passionate about? And you see how big that shift is. And not only did that shift happen, by the way, it also increased the average gift. So I think we're looking at something like a 6x increase when we move from column one to column three. I mean, that's how important language gets. Talk about a six times increase in bequests, you know, you're really talking about tens of billions of dollars over the years. Um, more examples here, right? Instead of you can save up to 80% on taxes through giving stock, try something like someone in the class above you, also from California, just donated stock and got an almost 80% tax benefit. And that feels very, very different. Oh, I want to go do what that person did, right? That's the feeling you get. Now, when we say this, what you don't want to do is avoid negative social proof. It discourages potential donors by highlighting a lack of support. So positive messaging is much more effective, right? Many people do this. You never want to say, not a lot of people do this, so please do it. Or a lot of people do this, don't do it. There's a famous example here from the Petrified Forest at, in National Park in Arizona. Uh, some of you have been, it's actually stunningly beautiful. And they were having a problem over the years of people removing small amounts of petrified wood, which is not a real problem if one person does it. It's a lot of problem if, if thousands of people do it. And they tried two different signs. The first one said, please don't remove petrified wood. The second one said, many visitors have removed petrified wood in the past, please don't do it. And it actually, that sign tripled threats, tripled thefts, excuse me, uh, compared to no sign at all. Now, why did that happen? Because it told people what other people in a similar situation did, even when it was asking them not to do it. And people said, oh, turns out that everyone else does it, I should do this too. So it, sh it shows the power of social proof uh, almost regardless of what else you say, right? When you tell other, you know, other people are doing this, then they'll do it, whether or not you want them to do it or not. So it's a really powerful tool here. Use it for good instead of for nine. A couple other tips here. Um, we're gonna add surprise when we're sharing new topics. So adding surprise triggers curiosity. It reduces defensiveness. Did you know you might be surprised to learn some supporters are surprised that they can receive more than 50% in tax savings when donating stock and more than 70% in some cases. Why, why does this work? Well, it allows, you know, we're talking about surprise. Uh, it allows people to be a little bit less defensive, not, not even uh, just you might not know, right? Because that says, that sort of implies that I don't know things and I want to be someone who knows things. So what you say is you might be surprised or or even other people are surprised. And you probably know this, but other people are surprised 
And that can be really, really effective here. Uh, tip nine, uh, there's some really great research on making sure that everything is accompanied with a clear reason. When you make a request, you will be much more successful if you follow it up very quickly with a reason. And adding a reason to your request can almost double your success rate in some contexts. What do we mean by that? Uh, we really mean saying, ask for the thing, and then say because, and then give a clear reason. Today, we're sharing Sophie's story with you because you have the power to improve her life. We need your help because millions of lives are at risk right now. We're asking for your donation today because we need to build a new shelter before winter comes. And then suddenly this gets much more compelling, right? So are we using that language? Are we really saying, are we not just saying, will you chip in $10? We chip in $10 because X, right? Or will you chip in $10, comma, this is incredibly important because Y. Um, we talked about personalization earlier. Here's some other thoughts on it. Remember that hearing your own brain triggers greater brain activation. So if I look at the most popular names in the past, right, there are a lot of Jennifers on the call. There are a lot of Elizabeths and Liz's. There are a lot of Kate's and Catherine's and Katie's. There's a lot of Michael's and Mark's and Bill's and Jim's and John's. And if you are one of those people, you are now paying more attention to the webinar than some of the other folks on the call. It's just, it's just the way it happens. Uh, please feel free to tell me if that's accurate or not, if you are one of those those names in the in the uh, in the chat, Laurie and, and Libby says yes. So hearing your own brain uh, creates brain activation. It signals it's important to you, right? So the more it's personalized, right, it's giving you more of a sense of control. It reduces information overload. If I say, uh, you know, the facts that I've just shared with you are particularly important to, to modern fundraisers in the state of California, in Illinois, and in Georgia those people are all paying more attention now too, right? Not just the names, right? So if you're in Missouri, you're now paying attention, but you weren't previously uh, because of that. Um, also, I, I'm learning now that, that there's quite a few more uh, variations of Elizabeth than I expected. <laughs> so Betsy and Libby, I think. Libby is short for Elizabeth. I never knew that before. Um, we can confirm or deny. Uh, really, really fascinating. Um, so what personal details do we have? Is it a favorite piece of art? Is it a class year? Is it a kid's or a spouse names? Um, progress updates for causes they previously donated to. Also a specific date they last donated. I mean, just imagine for a moment that you're, you're, you're a fundraiser to college and you can call me and say, you know, hey, we're calling our graduates and we, we we're asking for money. So that's okay. Well, we're calling our graduates in the class of 2006. And right now I'm talking to folks with international politics degrees or English degrees, whatever I have. Um, and you know, based on that experience, we'd really love for you to chip in. Uh, and by the way, the last time you chipped in was, was May 14th of 2021, and we really appreciate that gift, right? Do you mind doing it again? Suddenly, this is a, a different experience than the sort of generic smile and dial call. And, and most of you have a lot of that information available to you, and we work this in. So especially as we think about uh, our major donors or plan giving prospects, things like that. You know, are we really tailoring this? Right? Last time, last time we were in in the museum, I, I noticed you really like this. There's one, you know, there's one other a new exhibit that, that we'd love to share with you soon, right? Re remembering that other piece, naming it, you know, feels really valuable to folks. Uh, other things to try, right? Send an email with minimal branding, so you don't have to everything doesn't have to look extra polished. Things that feel like a one-to-one -one email can often be better. Think about including a link instead of a button. Use a genuine sign-off, right? So don't, don't sort of overly professionalize that. If you wouldn't sign off that way to a friend, maybe you don't do it. A couple of bonus tips, and we're going to get some time for, for questions and resource sharing. Um, use what, what we call a presumptive close. So if you're in sales, uh, even some of your, your uh, major gift officers will know this. But we're, communication excite we're communicating excitement, interest in speaking with them. Uh, I can't wait to share more about the benefits of stock gifts with you. Uh, avoid yes or no questions. Don't say, would you like to schedule a call? Say, would Thursday or Friday be better for you for a call, right? I'd love to, I'd love to chat to you about some of the new things happening at the museum and some opportunities for impact. Would Thursday or Friday be better? Not, do you want to talk to me, right? And they can always say no. But usually you say, oh, they'll say, oh, Friday, or maybe no, but next Wednesday is free. And so you create this sort of very different environment when we're using this presumptive close and giving these, you know, not asking yes or no questions in the same way. Uh, second bonus tip. This is really, really, really important. 
Um, and you don't need to use this exact sentence, but I promise you, if you use a version of this sentence in your emails, in all of your emails, you will be much better off. So what do we know before I show you what the sentence is? We know that reminding people of their assets, right? The research shows reminding people of their assets significantly increases willingness to give. And not just willingness, but how much they give. So if I say, oh, you know, what do you have in your retirement account? What kind of stocks do you have? Oh, that's great, amazing. Hey, listen, do you wanna chip into charity? That will result in significantly larger gifts and more proclivity to give. We also know from a lot of the research that we've shown previously and that, that uh, Dr. Russell James has done extraordinary work on is that non-cash gifts, meaning gifts of stock, of securities, of real estate, of mutual funds, of bonds, of donor advised funds, of crypto, of out of my IRA in the form of QCD, um, all of these tend to be much larger gifts from exactly the same people, right? And so the fastest way to actually grow your giving is to move more people to non-cash gifts. Um, so what we know here is that reminding people that they can give out of their assets gets you bigger non-cash gifts. But the secret here is it also gets you bigger cash gifts because we're reminding people of their assets in real time, right? Because of these anchor points that we're talking about. And so suddenly, yes, you're driving more donor advised fund gifts and that's awesome because now we have new, new major donor prospects. Some of these gifts are gonna be five or 10 or 15 or $50,000, but also it's driving the, the average cash gift up in a really interesting way. So here's the sentence you can use, um, technically two sentences, I guess, but you wanna have this extra language in here, right? Remember that many people, talk, we've talked about our social proof, that many people choose to give from their assets, stocks, mutual funds, give from their IRA, cryptocurrency, grants, et cetera, right? Um, and, and that's just, uh, there are a couple other versions of this that we can share with you at some point, but this language, this reminding people of their assets after we've, we've asked for uh, a donation is again gonna drive up, uh, it's gonna get more of these gifts, which is really, really, really important, but it's also gonna drive up the average size of your cash gifts because people are anchored differently. And so this is a way to have a pretty big impact. You don't even have to change the sentence every email. You just make sure it gets in there and suddenly you're driving better results because you're not just getting more gifts, the, the, the gifts on average are significantly larger, right? So that's pretty good. Um, all right, a couple of last things to keep in mind. Um, one thing is that I saw some, some interesting notes uh, in, the, uh, in the chat about AI. It can be really useful to help you get started. Um, Chatbots, particularly GPT, uh, GPT-4, which is a $20 a month subscription, quite useful. Google Bard is okay. Um, some of the other ones are okay for this. Um, you can ask AI to write several first drafts, pick your favorite, then edit. Great way to get unstuck. Um, you can think of it as a starting point, a time saver. You know, I, I think the best way to think about AI is not someone who's going to replace you. It's not. But it is going to be a really helpful buddy who's there whenever you feel stuck, whenever you need it. Um, you can always be like, just, you know, just write me a couple of notes encouraging me to finally sit down and write this thing. Um, or it can have a first draft. And so it really will help you uh, be more thoughtful and expansive. And so I think it'd be quite useful. You can also take an email you have for the class of 1974 and say, hey, do you mind adjusting this for the class of 1981? And it will actually do pretty good wonders there. A um, couple other notes from you all. So we asked you, what are your most effective writing strategies? And, and here's what some of you said. I just wanted to share it back because it was really interesting. Uh, someone said, personalize with effective storytelling, focus on those who benefit from philanthropy, and those who provide the generosity. Focus on giving to accomplish a tangible goal or fund a specific project like we talked about. Glad to hear you do it. Someone said 100% personalization. That's what makes the difference. Can't agree more. Be an authoritative and compassionate voice, right? Know what you're talking about, but don't be sort of arrogant. Um, tailoring the proposal to meet the donor's goals. Sharing how our mission helps achieve their goals for giving, right? That you are a conduit for helping them achieve the kind of impact they wanna have. Great point. And someone just said, hey, the Maya Angelou quote, people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel, which is a great, uh, a great uh, note to end on there. Um, in summary, a couple of things here, your final checklist, right? So when, when we send around the slides, which we will later today, you know, print this out or, or put it on your, your other screen, whatever. And just whenever we're writing emails, does our subject line inspire curiosity? If I read for more than nine seconds, well, I wanna read more. Is my story compelling and persuasive? Does a third grader know almost all the words in the language? 
uh, in the message? Do I give reasons for what I'm asking? Does it feel like it's written for a human by a human, right? As opposed to by an institution, which is a real problem, right? Do that as well. Okay, a couple of resources to share and then we'll dive into Q&A a little bit. Number one, um, my friend and colleague Phoebe is gonna drop a note in the chat. Uh, thank you, Phoebe, right on time, amazing. Also, Phoebe put a ton of work into making this, so thank you, Phoebe. Um, first things first on the survey, please fill it out, uh, partly because it's just enormously helpful to us to understand how this went, what you're thinking, what's useful, what isn't. Secondly, we will also give away a book via the survey. We'll give away 20 books. Highly, highly recommend it. You'll probably know in about 10 days if you get one or not. We tend to move pretty quickly on this. If you don't get it, it's not very expensive at your favorite local bookstore. Uh, please feel free to pick it up. Very good. I'll make a note of the survey. If you'd uh, like a chance to get a copy, please include your uh, address. As you might have guessed, we need to send it somewhere. Um, this Thursday, uh, a demo of our smart giving suite. If you would like to join me, this is a half hour-ish, uh, very informal, very relaxed. A lot of people ask, tell us more about free will. And we say, nope, these are all educational sessions. We love it. Uh, any, any nonprofit can come to these, doesn't matter where you are, how big you are, how small you are, et cetera. Um, but we do also want to tell you about free will. And so if you want to join that, uh, the thing that we're going to focus on Thursday is this really cool technology we have to make a lot of these non-cash gifts a lot easier. So donor advised funds, which you know are exploding, stock gifts, uh, big year for stock coming up, crypto, and then QCDs, which are becoming the most popular way for older donors to give. And those of you that have been in some of the older donor webinars and looked at demographics, you know there are a lot of these people. So getting good at older donors is a really important thing. So uh, join us. There's a note in the, in the survey again. If you want a calendar invite, we will give you a calendar invite to make it easy on you. Um, other next steps in two weeks. So after everyone has an incredibly wonderful Memorial Day, uh, and I hope you have a great time, hopefully after I see many of you in Utah, if you're there, uh, we are going to hang out in uh, exactly two weeks preparing for the fall 2023. So five early steps to ensure success. What do we basically need to put in place right now or when we start to craft our strategy for September, October, November, right before end of year? What are the key things there that will both have a big fall and set us up for really big end of year success? So we're gonna, it's gonna be very tactical and tangible. Um, you're welcome to join, you don't have to. You're welcome to bring colleagues or friends, you don't have to. Um, and if you need anything at all, uh, shoot me an email here at Patrick at Free Will. Also, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, love to share interesting things there and have good conversations. So would always love to um, love to connect with you there if you like. Also, really like learning about the stuff that you share um, and occasionally share things like cool job opportunities and other stuff like that. So um, great. So if you haven't already, um, uh, please, please, please take that survey and let's get to some questions. Um, okay. Um, oh, good question. Uh, Gay says, do we know how many different email accounts most people have? And how do we zero in on people's preferred email or should we be sending to multiple accounts? Um, one tip here is that people are mostly gonna sign up with the emails where they want email. So I would generally go broader. Certainly there, there are some, you know, I have two major emails. I have a personal email and I have a, a free will email and, and that's basically all of it. And occasionally I'll, I'll find out that I signed up twice for something and unsubscribe once. But generally, I'll subscribe with the, the one that I want to receive it at. And so, a uh, good avenue here. Oh, this, this is my great question. Should our writing still be concise and at an elementary reading level if our target audience is highly educated, i.e. attorneys? Um, love attorneys, very smart folks. Uh, my father was an attorney. Some of my best friends are attorneys. This applies all the time. And so it, it doesn't mean, you know, you're not speaking in, in baby language here, right? but you're being extremely clear. You're not using incredibly long sentences. You're not using tons of jargon unless it's widely and just totally universally understood by your audience, in which case you can use it because it's, it's gonna feel very simple to them, right? So it doesn't mean you can't talk about, I don't know, contract law or arbitration to a, um, to a group of, of arbitration lawyers, right? Or, or contract law lawyers. Uh, but it does mean you wanna make sure that that everyone reading that knows exactly, exactly what it is. And typically, simple and more concise is better for every audience, right? Your more educated audiences, your doctors, your lawyers, et cetera, they also tend to be busy people. They're reading a ton. 
and really breaking through there will still apply, right? You are at very low risk of being too clear or too concise. Um, generally good question. Uh, question, uh, have you started using AI to generate uh, effective emails by putting in specific prompts? Yes, we've been playing around with this a lot, doing a bunch of work later this week to block it out. Uh, making sure you're really specific instead of just, hey, write a, write a fundraising email for X. Um, I also found that um, some of the different chatbots perform vastly differently. And so I think, Phoebe, correct me if I'm wrong here. I think in a couple, within a few months, we're going to do a second follow-up webinar on AI and talk about some best practices there. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, some really cool stuff there. Um, Great. Jill says, can you give examples of demonstrating impacts with a plan gift versus an outright gift? And I think a lot of it still applies, right? And so um, another way to think about this is you, you can't promise someone that a plan gift is going to do X immediately, obviously, because plan gifts are deferred and delayed. Um, so you might want to give a couple of examples without sort of putting it in pure math form. So, um, you know, a gift in your will, let's go back to the land trust opportunity. Right, a gift in your will can help preserve, you know, a specific portion of a place like, like this park in Vermont that we know the person cares about, right? For for multiple multiple generations, and have sort of an outstanding impact on, you know, you can imagine a a particular family in in fifty years, right, walking through it, you know, experiencing nature for the first time because of the gift you made, and in that world, we're making it really concrete without sort of contractually promising that that. You know, your gift, which may come at any point in the future, is going to do exactly X. But really honing in on that sort of specific story of what could be in the future. There's an important point about storytelling. It doesn't all have to be stuff that's already happened. And so you can tell that story in vivid detail, right? I just, you know, I, I want you to close your eyes and imagine for a moment that it's 2112. And we need to make sure that our that our nature is preserved and it it's you know, that people are finding the same joy that we're finding today. And one of the best ways to do that is a gift in your will or trust. I just want you to picture, you know, family in the future walking through this, seeing the same daffodils that have existed for millennia, right? Things like that will really connect with people instead of just being sort of hand wavy about uh, where that goes. Uh, great questions. Let's do one or two more. Um, ooh, when would you... Um, Courtney says, have you ever measured these two words against each other, better versus smarter? As in many people are surprised to learn that giving from your assets is actually smarter or better for your financial well-being. Um, Courtney, we haven't measured it. So I'm gonna give you my best guess, but as I told you at the beginning of the call, the best guess from smart people is often wrong, but I will, I will give you my sort of hot take on there. Smarter can be useful. Now, why is smarter useful? because it, it, it shapes and, and coincides with the identity that the donor wants to have. So there's a lot of interesting research around voter turnout, where there's a ton of work being done on different psychological tests. Why is that on voter turnout? Because it's really easy to measure and it comes pretty quickly. So you can send you know, mailings to one house and mailings to this other house and, and then sort of look up after who voted and who didn't, right? Voting records are public. And so it's really good research, uh, really good tool for researchers. And one of the things they find is when they say things like, thank you for being a voter, you know, or we hope you make a plan to vote. Thank you for being a voter. Thank you for being someone who votes and really building into the identity as opposed to being, uh, thank you for voting, which is an action that anybody can do. Thank you for being a voter. And so we say, thank you for being smarter with your giving, right? It's not a thing that you're doing. It's a person you are. And that really shapes behavior. So uh, great. Great question. Um, Elizabeth asks, do we have some full sample letters we can use for implementation? We have a, if you go to the freewill.com site and you click on the four nonprofits, we have a ton of template resources, a ton uh, for uh, decks for your board, for emails, for text messaging, for things around plan giving, for things around major giving, right? For um, a lot more. I mean, literally just hundreds of different resources there. So go check out um, freewill.com slash nonprofits and I will put that link in the chat so you have it. Um, but we work really hard on thinking about how to make things a bit easier for you and sometimes it works. So 
Um, let me just put this here in the chat, uh, but go ahead, check that out. See what's useful for you. Um, let me see if we can get a clickable link there. Here it is. But, um, and you know, I would love to, once you do it, I'd love to know what you found useful or if there's some template that you think, oh, I, I just wish this template existed and we'll be happy to help you there. All right, let's see one last question. Um, oh, great question. Any suggested resources to check the reading level of an email or a letter? Uh, AI can be useful here. There are a bunch of things online where if you just say, you know, tell me the reading level of this message and Google it, you can then put in your whole document and it will tell you this is a fourth grade level, this is an eighth grade level, this is a, a 16th grade level, meaning college senior. Um, so very useful. Uh, Suzanne, do we ever include photos and emails? Yeah, photos can be really useful. Um, uh, when we talk about photos, a lot of the same rules apply. Photos of one person over a big group, photos of a cute animal over anything. Um, think about, about pictures that, that really add value. Um, so yeah, um, Alexandra, by the way, recommends the Hemingway app if anyone wants to do that. I haven't used it myself, but I have heard good things about it. Um, and then Bonnie says, would it change if you're advising a small nonprofit versus a large nonprofit? No, a lot of these, a lot of these rules apply whether it is, um, whether you're running, even if you're running just one person, right? A lot of this still applies. So, uh, let's pause there. Um, I wanted to just say a really big thank you for coming. I really love diving into great writing. Um, if you have examples that you're really proud of, uh, feel free to send them my way. We'll feature them in the future. Um, but thank you for being here. I think uh, the, uh, the people who are most successful in careers like yours are the people who are constantly learning, always trying to improve, and you know, making a really big impact on a lot of amazing organizations. So big, big, big thank you for being here. We'd love to see you in two weeks. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn if you're interested. You can always email me. If you haven't filled out the survey already, uh, obviously we would love for you to do that. And generally have a great week. Happy Memorial Day. Happy start of summer. And look forward to seeing you in, well, I'll see some of you on Thursday. So please come hang out with us on Thursday. But otherwise, I will see many of you in June. So uh, happy Memorial Day. Happy summer. And see you all soon.